for uh, all of you who are watching, thank you for uh, being willing to do this. I have two uh, really important people in my life right up here with me. I want to introduce uh, to my right, this is Cindy Landum. Now, Cindy is Bob Landum, our missions pastor's wife, but that is just a small segment of who you are. You're an amazing <laughs> woman. Amy and I have known and loved Cindy for years and years. I remember when we first met, I was, I was a youth pastor to your, your kids, and so that's how we got to know each other. But here's what I love about you. I don't know anybody that is more real than Cindy Landum. I don't know anybody who's more full of life and, and just fun. So this is going to be cool and just a brilliant person. So thank you for being willing to do this. Amy had a huge influence on our Katie, by the way. That's, that's good. That's the beginning of all that. Yeah. Obviously, you didn't say me. You said Amy. So Amy I, that's actually. Good. That just yes. got awkward. Yeah, more Amy. That's good. <laughs> that's right. So uh, here's what I want to do because uh, we just came out of a message on overcoming temptation. Obviously, we were dealing with, with Joseph and his temptation with, with Potiphar. And uh, when we talk about this, Brad, we, we always just go to the, the sex issue because it's obviously there. But I, I think there's more layers to this uh, as it relates to temptation. Um, you know, for, for me, even in, in my life, it's food is a big bugaboo for me. It's really probably the, the, the greatest temptation that I have. But when you read this story and you see Potiphar's wife, I mean, she's an absolute piece of work, isn't she? And, and what she does and how she tempts Joseph is, is really over the top. But talk to us a little bit. Of, I, I think there's some really powerful takeaways, not just about sexual temptation, but even food here. Absolutely. I mean, that is how food is today. For most of human history, people have used more energy finding food, killing food, cooking food than, you know, than they needed. Right. Or um, then they, they used more getting it, I'm trying to say. But for us, it's everywhere. It's just like Potiphar's wife. Right. In our face, available, attractive, it's there. And we really have to have a relationship with ourselves and food that keeps us from always falling for that temptation because it's here 24 seven. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, I see that. I, I think when we, when we take a look at Potiphar's, we take a look at Potiphar's wife as, as Cindy said, I mean, it, it's available, it's attractive. And I mean, here's a, here's a 17, 18 year old boy. I mean, it, you know, he's got hormones. I mean, this is this can be a really, really dangerous spot that he found himself in, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's no question. And, and even we can do that sexually. We can do that with food. I mean, Amy, who's sitting over here to my left right now, she loves the Food Network. And so I'll, I'll come home and that's on. And so, I mean, just all this amazing, it's just right in our face all the time. So we really got to have a game plan for dealing with that. We do. Yeah, and that's what I want us to, I want us to spend the next few minutes really helping people for a game plan of whatever that temptation is. And we're going to really press into food a little bit. Okay. And you're an accomplished writer. You've written a book called The Liberated Eater, which is really cool. And you've uh, got resources. You do coaching and seminars and, and just do a great job with that. But would you mind just telling folks a little bit about your journey with food over the last really several years? Oh, sure. Mine is like so many people's. I just remember being a kiddo and enjoying playing and not, not thinking about food at all. And then, you know, you hit puberty and my body started to change and put on some weight. And because my mom has struggled with her weight, she had a fear of me gaining weight. Mm. So mom, out of love, became the food police. Mm. And the food police never has a good, never has the effect they hope to have. Right. So there was sneaking, food became a big deal. Yeah. There was shame. And um, instead of just being a, a nourishment and fuel, it became a thing. And um, I was a teenager in the 70s. The only option we knew about then was dieting. We now know physiologically and psychologically that restriction, uh, underdoing causes overdoing eventually. Yeah. So it was not a good um, answer, but it was the one we had. Yeah. And over the years, food became more and more of an issue, more and more, it was my biggest thrill and my greatest enemy. Um, and I, I lost and gained the same 20 pounds through high school, then went off to college and no more food police. Yeah. So instead of the freshman 15, I gained the freshman 40. Yeah. And um, from there, it was just um, some bulimia. It was a big deal. Yeah. And I fought it and um, didn't, didn't have good tools. I felt very broken. I was isolated. As we all know, the more isolated we are, with um, that, with a temptation, the bigger it gets. Yeah. 
Um, finally, in my 40s, I just gave up. I literally knew that it had won. Um, and strange, you know, this is how the Lord works. When I gave up, slowly but surely, that innate body wisdom that he has us in, in all of us, we're born with it, had room when I stopped doing trying to micromanage, it had room to flourish again. And it took years. Yeah. But um, I was a teacher at the time, and that teacher in me was just researching what on earth happened. And long story short, a- as I researched, it became clear that it wasn't a fluke. I wasn't just lucky. It wasn't a miracle. There are... Um, intuitive mindful eating is a thing and it works and it's from the father we are geared for it to work yeah you know one of the things here's what i know like there are going to be people watching right now and this is just the way god god works there are going to be people watching right now with what you shared about your story they're going to really resonate with that i mean there are going to be elements of their life and their past that they're going to say that's really a part of my story. So what we're going to do, and you never ask, I'm the one who initiated all of this. So just so everybody knows, um, you never ask for Yeah, because this is scary for me right. a little bit. Yeah, right. this is uncomfortable. <laughs> I, I know. Um, but we're going to put your book up, just a, a shot of your book up oh, uh, on our website. And you. so somebody can look at that and say, you know what, I, I resonate with that. I want to learn more. There's a chance for them to, to access that and, and really get some help. And I, I pray that God would use that in a powerful way. And I'm available for questions at any time. It's, this is my passion. Yeah. Once you've been in prison and you finally are free, you just want to talk about it. Yeah, that's really cool. And that's the way the body of Christ works best is when we help each other yeah. with that. You know, one of the things that Cindy said that I, I resonated in, with is, you know, laws don't really change us. And that was really kind of when you were talking about the food police and having all these external laws, that doesn't really change us. But, you know, even if he, as we think about and guys aren't the only ones that, that struggle with sexual purity or pornography, all those things. We know that uh, crosses genders. But we see that, that that principle is really true. Really, just having more laws that people have really does, doesn't really change them in that, that fight either. Have you seen that to be true in guys that you're working with? Yeah, absolutely. Because really, what we're dealing with with pornography or what we're dealing with with a, a food uh, addiction, really fill in the blank with any vice, it's the tip of the iceberg. It's the behavior, and society loves to come and say, hey, let's fix the behavior. But at the bottom of that iceberg is really a belief system, and all of that is being played out through this behavior. So somewhere there's something within that person that feels like they're not enough, and they go to something else. And that's a coping mechanism. And so you can really substitute what we're talking about with so many different words. It's just these happen to be our stories. So my story specifically is about pornography and how pornography became my coping mechanism. It became the behavior, but really there was a belief system underneath that was faulty. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. You resonated with what was Brad, Brad was, was saying. Totally. Yeah. And you see that play out with folks that you're working with? Oh my goodness, yes. We think it's about the food, but it's never about the food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. that's how we're coping. Yeah, absolutely. In the story that we looked at tonight in scripture with, uh, with Joseph, and so one of, the, one of the things that really struck me is if anybody could have played the victim, it really would have been Joseph, right? Uh, he, he certainly could have done that. I mean, here he is stripped away from his family. I mean, his brothers just treated him in just a totally immoral, just vengeful hatred, all these things that he goes through. But yet we see him take this really bold stand and, and really make amazing choices that honor God. Do you see that, that sometimes with people that you're working with, sometimes that uh, sometimes they, we can sort of play the role of a victim thinking I've always been this way or these circumstances and situations are so difficult. So that's sort of driving the behavior. Do you see that sometimes? Absolutely. Really, one of the first things I do after hearing someone's story is help them once again believe in their own God-given strength, and uh, especially because dieting doesn't work, but we think it, it's us that's not working. Yeah. Um, people come into the process of liberated eating just thinking that they're failures. They have no willpower. They're weak. It's all their fault. And it's the diet that's broken, not them. Yeah. So my first, um, my first job is to help them believe again, absolutely, you have everything you need for this journey. You were born with it. It's in your DNA. Yeah. Let's just start finding what works and stop doing yeah. what can't. Yeah. 
And I think going back to Joseph, because I'm a preacher, I always have to, always have to do that. So you right. just have to forgive me. But, <laughs> you know, I, I love the fact that it would have been easy for him to, to co- have a cop out, but understanding who he was and, and, and what, who God was and the faithfulness of God, he believed in that. And that was a greater story than the lies that he would have, would have, would have heard and kind of believed. Absolutely. And so I, I know a part of what we talked about was just this greater story or having this noble vision, which is what we talked about a little bit tonight, having a noble vision for our life really can help us with the decisions that we're making in, in our daily life. You want to talk a little bit about a noble vision for your, li- your life and what you try to teach folks? Sure, absolutely. So when we're dieting, everything is about the weight, the number on the scale. Mm-hmm. So we're food focused, we're scale focused. Um, it's pass fail. We're either yeah. obeying the diet or we've blown it, which causes us then to eat everything and start again on Monday. And it's this crazy, crazy cycle. So one of the things that we do, we have plenty of tools for practical, you know, at the table. Yeah. You have to have those. But when push comes to shove, deep inside of us, there's got to be this desire for life. Yeah. for a full life, to live wholeheartedly. Yeah. Anybody that has had any kind of addiction knows that you're walking around and you almost look normal, but inside there's this battle and you're not available and present for, to live your life full on. Yeah. And, and it always grieves you. So one of the things we do in the first couple of chapters of workshop is develop what we call a wellness vision. It's basically just, it is a noble vision. Yeah. It's your preferred future. Yeah. And um, you know, it's so much easier, to, it's hard to stop doing something, yeah. but it is much more fun and much more effective to start doing something. Yeah. And so we create, we, we say we create a mini movie in our head. It's this vivid story that just symbolizes the life we want. Because when I'm there, when Bob brings home a package of pistachio Oreos, I mean, you know, I've got amnesia (laughs) about everything else. And forget the book, forget the book, forget the slowing down, forget that. Um, But wow, when I have this, this anchor in my heart of this life, I want this thing I don't want to miss. Right. It wins. Yeah. Um, not 100% of the time, perfection isn't necessary, right. but most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So mine is dancing at May May's wedding when I'm 85. Yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. And I, you know, we were talking about this this week on the phone, and it was, and it's really helpful to me because, again, to say that th- this is a struggle in my life, but, and I know we can talk about boundaries and all of those things that we need to do, and, and I'm not saying that's not good. There's, there's certainly some helpful sure, things. Sure, sure. But I think that just that higher calling that God's given us that really motivates us and, and drives us, you know, to be able to serve him. I, I want to have energy at the end of my race to, to really serve him. And, and I know poor choices now can keep me from that. And mm. so I don't know. I'm a terrible dancer. I want to be honest with you. I don't think my granddaughter oh, would me want too. me. She wouldn't want me dancing at her wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you that. So I think that's really, I think that is a great truth that is really super practical. I, I, th- I think it's really founded in scripture because ultimate this vision is I want to honor God with my life and with my body. And so all those things are really there. Yes. I think it helps. And it has to be fresh and available. So when in the moment when you need it, you can draw, you can turn that movie on real fast. Yeah. Here's what I want. Here's what I do not want to jeopardize. Yeah. That's really helpful. One of the things you said earlier, and this isn't on the list of quest- the, the, oh, the, no. the pre-selected questions. So, um, I want both of you guys to, to talk about this for just a second. You talked about the thrill. I think this is, uh, you know, food's, I mean, it's delicious. I'm, I love to eat. I, Me I mean, too. I, I find joy in that, you know? And so, I mean, if we, sometimes when we're talking about temptation or struggles, um, certainly sexual, you know, there is this thrill season with anything. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, there's endorphins that are released in our, our mind. There is that, that buzz and that thrill when it's a great meal or, or there's immorality there and the, a, a cheap thrill there. That, that happens. And so, I mean, to dis, I think sometimes in the church we've just dismissed, this, dismissed that, like that doesn't even exist. But it does exist. Mm. But there's really something greater that we want. And, and, and I think that's, that noble vision is really getting at that. Would, wouldn't you really say? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But our appetites, I mean, our brain registers the reward. 
uh, whether it's a sexual or, or food or gambling or watching TV or raging, whatever it is, there is a reward and mm. our brain remembers that. Yeah. You know, our brain is, God's given us this amazing brain and it tries to comfort or numb or distract when we have uncomfortable feelings. And so the reward is there, it's real. Yeah. And we do have to be anchored in something that is long-term, yeah. noble, and true. And we've got to have some tools in our pocket. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, it's not going to go down easily, yeah. but there's always a way through. Yeah. Always. Uh, absolutely. And just not, and again, not playing that victim card. I've always been this way. I've always given to this. That doesn't mean that that's always the way it has to, has to be. I, I, absolutely. Yeah. I, I think as you, you think about, as it relates to sexual things, and uh, for those of you who don't know, Brad White, I, I didn't introduce you. I just assumed okay. everybody knows. Brad is our men's minister here and does a great job with that. And one of the things I love about Brad is Brad's just been really open and courageous and brave about your struggle. And I can't tell you how many guys have, have shared with me that when you opened up and really talked about that, how that just gave them freedom in their life to talk about something because they just felt like they were alone with that. So God, God's used you. But I, I want to talk a little bit tonight about um, this idea of victim sort of mentality. Cindy talked about it, it can affect eating. But again, here's, here's Joseph. And we, we said in the message that we're probably never more susceptible to temptation than when we're struggling, stressed, or we're going through a difficult time. And so how do you see that play out uh, really with men that you minister to? And what might you say about that that could be helpful to guys watching right now? Yeah, so there's a really great acronym uh, that I love. It's called HALT. And HALT stands for hungry, angry, lonely and tired. And I wanna speak specifically about, about two of those being anger and loneliness. So when a guy is angry, let's say that he has um, you know, tried to convince his wife, hey, it's time to spend some time together and, and she's not interested and he becomes angry at her, he can give himself this feeling of justification. I deserve this so I can go and act out with pornography or whatever it might be because I'm, I'm angry and I deserve something. So that's one example. Uh, another example is loneliness, that when we find ourselves in isolation, that we are best set up for a failure, specifically in the sexual area, because it's such a private, hidden sin that when we are isolated, we are really set up to fail. I think about uh, 1 Peter 5.8, it tells us to be alert and of sober mind that our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And the imagery there, we've all watched Animal Planet and have seen lions attack. They attack the lone, the one that's isolated, the sick. It's not the herd that's being attacked. It's the ones that are by themselves. Yeah. And so for me, really kind of a, a dangerous situation that would could be brought up would be a man who's angry with his wife, he's isolated alone, and he has idle time in front of him. I think he has set himself up for, for disaster to come his way. And that's really where accountability comes in. Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. Yeah. That's why I have to have a Pastor Brady in my life who speaks in and calls out what they see in me that's that's not right. That's not uh, reflecting the qualities that God has called me to. And that verse, you know, we, we use that a lot. We talk about iron sharpening iron. We think about it as being this beautiful process of these two pieces of metal just kind of going across each other gingerly. But I don't think that's really what happens. I think you have a really rough, messed up piece of iron and you have another piece of iron and they're coming together and it's hard and it's sharp and it's hot and it's this process of refining. So it's really stepping into conversations that you probably don't want to have yeah. But I know and you know that it's for my best for you to have those conversations with me because you love me, you care about me, and you want to see at the end of my life me reflecting Christ. Yeah, that's really good. That's very helpful, super practical. I think about back, back to Joseph's story because I heard a great message on it just a little bit ago and it really helped me. <laughs> um, but we're all, we can all be prone to play the victim card. And it's just helpful to see a guy that could have played the card and, and he didn't and he, and he walks in victory. And that's helpful to me. It doesn't, doesn't change everything, but it's helpful to see that God can do this through me. So it gives me hope. You mm -hmm. said something that was 
uh, really brilliant and I think really helpful for us is when we, we st- anytime that we give in to sinful behavior, I mean, there is a reward and, and our, our brain, sure. you know, there's physiologically something that's happening there. And I don't think we have, we probably haven't spoken into that very much in the church because I think it's hard for us to understand, but there's that sort of reward that happens. And then, so that just makes it a little bit harder that, that next time because we're, we're sort of, we're sort of trained in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but here's the thing in, 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 in Joseph's story and something that, that I think God is trying to teach me that as I look at temptation, I don't have to always look at it as an opportunity to fail. This is an opportunity for me to just take these tools, this relationship I have with God and take a positive step in victory. And then the next time it's a little bit easier. Do, do you think that's true when, when, you, when we have a night when we really make good choices as it relates to food? Is, does the next time it get a little bit easier? Or what have you seen? Absolutely, because you've exercised that muscle yeah. of making a choice you feel good about. Yeah. Sure. Now, when we have years of overeating, right. then, you know, that's a, that's a deep yeah. neuropathway. Yeah. So we do have to have patience with ourselves as we are creating new paths. Yeah. Um, but absolutely, the more victories, that's why we love to share victories with each other. Yeah. We make much of that. We celebrate um, in our community. Um, And I love something Brad said. It made me think of what we say a lot. When stress is high, support's got to be higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. And also when things have gone well, we want to also share that. So community is huge Mm -hmm. in overcoming any kind of addiction. Yeah, that's really... That's really a helpful, really a helpful tool. And sometimes it's, it's harder for us. The Bible says to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Sometimes it's easier to weep with those who weep who've had a, a you know, have fallen and made mistakes. And yeah. when somebody has a great week, then we, we start feeling bad about ourselves because we didn't have, so it's harder <laughs> to do that sometimes, but we need that. So that's a really, yeah. a really good principle. So Brad, let's talk about boundaries because I, I think we, we see that in this scripture uh, tonight. I mean, as, as we were looking at Joseph's story, he understood what, what God's boundary was. And then he made a decision not to be alone with this, with this woman, which was, a, I mean, super sharp and spiritually mature for a young man to make a decision like that. Mm-hmm. And obviously, that's a helpful thing. So as you're working with guys and teaching guys, obviously change happens when God begins to change our heart. There's mm-hmm. no, question, no question about that. But just as we think about godly boundaries in this area, what are some things that you think uh, you've seen really be helpful for men? Yeah, well, let me lead with this. I think to say to a person who struggles with pornography, hey, don't ever look at pornography again, that feels impossible to them. But if I were to say to them, hey, do you think you could go to the end of the day and just honor God and, and make sure that you're really cognizant of what you're viewing? You know, I think they can do that. And it brings me back to this thing my mom used to say as a kid, inch by inch, it's a cinch. Yard by yard, it's hard. And so what I teach guys is to celebrate the little victories every single day and to focus on what's in front of them mm-hmm. right then. We talked about accountability and I think accountability is the, the best thing to really fight and deal with pornography. And there's so many great things that you can put in place, like not being alone with a woman. If I meet with uh, a, a lady, I'm going to have somebody else in that meeting with me. I'm not going to ride in the car with a, a woman that's not my wife. And so I think there's some very practical things that we can put in place. But the one that I want to focus on is we talked about this Potiphar's wife. She's kind of in Joseph's face. She's right there and she's begging him to mm-hmm. come to bed. Well, we have Potiphar's wife in our phone. It, it's there. It's in our pocket. It's accessible 24 seven. Pornography yeah, wow. is available anytime that we want to access it. And so I think accountability with our technology is absolutely huge. Think about if there was a, a war that was being waged The easiest way to defeat another army is to end their supply, to shut down their supply. If they're being sourced by a river, you would dam the river and then they wouldn't be able to receive their supplies anymore. And so in the same way, we're being sourced by our iPhones, by our tablets, by our smart devices. And so how can we stop the flow, stop the supply for those devices? Because I think that's the best thing that we can do is get accountable to our devices with an accountability person. I want to read um, one, one scripture that, that pops out to me here. This is Matthew 18, 9. And Jesus says, if your eye, even a good eye, causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for, your, for you to spend your life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. And I think to that, we're like, Whoa, Jesus, yeah, like yeah, yeah. that's, that's nuts. That's, yeah. that's crazy. Like you want me to gouge my eye out? 
Well, I've got a modern version. I've kind of done my own, uh, my own twist on this. It goes something like this. If your iPad, your iPhone, your tablet, even a good iPhone, iPad, tablet causes you to stumble, it. it's better for you to throw, get rid of that iPad, iPhone, tablet than to walk a life that isn't pure. Yeah. And so for me, it's sometimes drastic measures. I tell a lot of the guys that I meet with, you know what? You can't handle that smartphone in your pocket. It's time to go back to the old flip phone. Yeah. That's really, that's a helpful, helpful. I didn't know what you were doing when you were retranslating scripture there. Yeah, I'm not sorry. sure how that was going to go. I thought, wow, this is going to be good here. Uh, that's, that's powerful. But, you know, as we, as we, we think about that, even in our, in our own lives, there's a, there's a lot, of, I mean, this just kind of has so much play, play back and forth. And, and as it relates to eating or multiple, multiple things. And again, uh, having somebody that you, you check in with, you know, as it relates to mm. some of the things that God has established in your life. Have you seen that really work in, in the folks that you deal with? with Absolutely. I, I mean, nobody gets well alone. It's yeah. it, isolation just makes everything worse. Yeah. Um, we talk a lot about boundaries. We use the word guardrails. We yeah. think about, you know. I stole on, that from you. No, I don't know if no, you noticed great. that. I, yeah. We love it because sometimes for ex-dieters, boundaries and rules just make us want to break them because we had so many yeah. and they were impossible to keep. But guardrails, you think about going down a road, there aren't guardrails everywhere, just where it's treacherous. And then you're so grateful for them. They're keeping you safe. Yeah. And so we, we have lots of guardrails. One I think of we've used a lot during COVID because we're at home so much. Um, and this is just a simple, it may seem so silly, but it really works. After dinner, make sure you've, got a, you've really enjoyed your dinner. You've taken time with it. It's satisfying. You didn't rush through it. You know, if you can't do that with the kids, then wait till they're in bed, then have, have a satisfying dinner. But make a little sign that says kitchen's closed after dinner. You got mm. your dishes all cleaned up and set that sign out. And then when you kind of go in there about 9.30 to get those chips. Yeah. It, it's, You've been at my house, haven't it's you? A, yeah. I've been yeah. at mine. You know, yeah. it's this guardrail. It's this speed bump. Oh, yeah. You know what? I could have that for breakfast. Yeah. And I'd rather go to bed feeling this way rather than getting in bed and regretting yeah. that I ate to the bottom of the chip bag. Yeah. So sometimes it's just a little guardrail. Sometimes it's a huge guardrail, depending on what you need. Yeah. But there's always a way through. Yeah. And we, and we see that in scripture. God always provides a way out. Sometimes it's just, sometimes it's just running. And I want to, I want to <laughs> yes. close with this because this is how the, this is how jo our, Joseph's story ends. He's in over his head. She traps him and nobody's in the house and he just, just runs. Mm -hmm. He just takes, you know, just gets out of there as quick as he, quick as he can. So let's talk about that a little bit. Obviously the story here is with immorality. Let, let's talk about how, how does that really play out in a guy's life and what are times when, you know, it's, we're not supposed to stay there and fight. We're just supposed to run. What would you say to men as it relates to that principle? So two scriptures come to mind here. The first is Ephesians 6, 1. And Ephesians 6, 1 tells us to put on the full armor of God so that we can stand firm against the schemes of the enemy. And I think that that's wise. We need to put on the armor of God so that we are ready to take on the schemes of the enemy. But then there's this verse in 1 Corinthians 6, 18 that says, flee sexual immorality. All other sins that a person commits are outside of the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And so I think a lot of times we sit and we hear biblical theologians talks and they're, they're exegeting texts and they're giving us all this deep meaning. I don't think there's a lot of deep meaning here. I think it actually means run. Yeah. And so when it comes to a sexual sin, scripture tells us to run. And I think that's because God knows we don't stand a chance. And so anytime it's a sexual sin, I say, get out of there. Yeah. As far away, as fast as you can. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great, great principle. Now, as it relates to the, the food world, so is Same. there sort of a correlation as it relates there as far as running? Absolutely. In our last group coaching call, we talked about mastering the skill of walking away. And there's this magic two minutes that psychologists tell us about. If we, I mean, when we're right there with the food, the donuts in the break room, yeah. all our senses are there. We smell them. We, we're salivating. Yeah. But two minutes, just two minutes away from it. And, and engage our senses in something else. You can just go wash your hands with warm water and smell the soap and just, it, it breaks the spell. Yeah. And sometimes you have to run, 
Sometimes you just walk, but yeah. give yourself two minutes yeah. and that space that, that's is magic. A, I mean, that is a super practical principle that I, 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 I can apply tonight. Yes. Right? Just two yeah. minutes away. And then if, if two minutes, if I'm still hungry, so I should call, that's when I call. Call me or take another okay, two minutes. Take another right? two, I'm going to need four. I'm going to have to take four. That's really, really helpful. You guys have done a great job tonight. I think this is a really an important thing and a helpful thing. And I would say to everybody watching, if you want uh, you want some, some more information as it relates to just this temptation, whether that's pornography, uh, sexual, any kind of sexual things that are going on inside of marriage, Certainly an email to you. We'll put Brad's email address uh, up. And, and I love how you've made yourself available to so many guys. You have a really good book that you've put together. And so we're going to put that up on the screen too. If guys want to take a look at that, that's a great resource for them as well. Thank so thank you for doing that. And then for you, we're, we're going to put Cindy's resource up uh, again there. And that's a great thing for folks to take advantage of. And thank you for your willingness. Anything you want to say to folks on our way out? Final thought? Oh my goodness. I put you on the spot. Yes, absolutely. I, you know, I think I want to say that food is such a visceral daily thing. Mm. We, we can't completely leave it like we could drugs or pornography. So taking the time, trusting that there is a way through, that it's already in, in our, our DNA. The Lord's put it there for us to have a, not just a survivable relationship with food, but a really enjoyable relationship with food. Mm. So no matter where you are, or how awful it feels, he's got a sweet, nourishing relationship with food for you. That's really good. Thank you. You know what, what Jesus says, it's for freedom that he's come to set us free. Yes. And that's what the Lord wants for us yes. in every area of our life. And so I, I hope just these few minutes that we had just to talk about these really important issues. I hope that uh, all of you watching, that God just used it, maybe just for one principle that could just bring a greater level of freedom in your life. That would certainly be worth it for us. God bless you guys. Thanks for being involved in this with us.